Appreciate it. I, I owe you one. All right. Hey, welcome everybody to CCNA Sunday. We are going to focus on NAT network address translation. If you ever wonder, hey, what's Keith like when he's not presenting? I'm a lot like this when I'm not presenting. <laughs> um, I'm pretty much the same person all the time. I'm so glad to have you here. So um, in the world of NAT, let's talk about what it is, why we need it, and then we'll actually implement it. And I'm going to use some drawing tools right here. And I have some notes. I do have some notes from yesterday when I went through a dress rehearsal of a lab I wanted to do. All right, so let's imagine that we have a company. Uh, let's call it Acme Incorporated. And also I wanna get your opinion on this too. So this is me in a little, <laughs> hi, I'm in a little circle in the top right hand corner of my screen. All right, so let me know about feedback on that, whether I should keep that or not in the future. All right, so Going back to the desktop, if we have Acme, Acme Incorporated and we have several sites, maybe we have a site, um, we'll just call it the headquarters site. And at the headquarters site, they've got an IP addressing space of 10.16.0.0 with a 24-bit mask. So what we know, that means is that this is the network portion, 10.16.0, and the last part is the host addresses. And we also have another site, and let's go ahead and put this site, at, we'll call it site one. And at that site, they're using Actually, you know what? Let me take a little bit of that off. You guys will be able to handle this. Let's say they're using um, 10.16.0.0 slash 21. That's, that's the address space I want headquarters to go ahead and use. And let's say for site one, they're using 10.16.8.0 slash 21. And at site one, and at site two, they are using 10.16.16.0 slash 21. So we have three sites, geographically uh, different locations, and that's their mask. So join me in Subnet Sunday, or Subnet Saturdays, and we'll talk about, about, about the masks, including that one that I just missed through. That should be a 21-bit mask. Great. So let's imagine we have computers at each of those sites. Uh, let's say we have a uh, PC here, and its IP address is 10.16.0.10. And at, at site one, we have a, a PC out here somewhere off the 1016 network or 101616 network. And we'll call that uh, PC2 and we'll call this PC3. All right. So what is in common with all of these networks? And the answer is what's in common is, is that they all have start with a private RFC 1918 address. So RFC 1918 is a a standards document that was written a long time ago that basically says that here are some addresses that you can use internally. And the benefit of that is that if we have a, a company and we need to do IP addressing in the company, we can use these sets of addresses. So anything that starts with a 10 is a private RFC 1918 address. Everybody can use it, and a lot of people do. Um, another range of addresses that's private from that same RFC is, is 172.16 through 172.31, anything that starts with that can be is a RFC1918 address. And the third one is a 192.168 anything address. Those are all private. So there's nothing wrong with private addresses inside of a company because you can reach everything. It's wonderful. However, when you try to go out of that company or you try to reach somewhere else, uh, the internet doesn't like those private RFC1918 addresses. Not that it doesn't like them, but it won't forward them. So if this is the internet, and you might be thinking, uh, you know, Keith, I thought the internet was going to be a lot bigger than that. Well, in this case, this will be our internet. And so with this internet, if we have any addresses that come from those private RFC 1918 addresses, 190, I'll put them in order, 10.0.0.0 with a slash 8, or 172.16.0.0 with a slash 12, or 192.168.0.0 with a slash 16. That's the actual beginning parts that represent the RFC 1918 addresses. So the challenge is we can use those internally in our companies, but if a, comp uh, a router, if a, if a person with an IP address like this wants to go out to the internet, the internet does not route private RFC 1918 addresses. They need a real address. So the real addresses would be everything or a lot of addresses outside of these ranges. So what we do is we get a, a device between our networks and the internet, and we'll call this, uh, let's call it router one, and we do this game called lie. That's the game. That's the game of network address translation. 
and there's a few flavors of it, and I'd like to share one of them with you. It's called Source Nat, Source Network Address Translation, and I'm going to jot something up, Source Nat. Okay, and with Source Nat, what it means, and it, this is this is pretty cool because a lot of people don't get this, even people who work with computer networks for a long time. Source Nat means that when a person like Bob, the user, is going to send a packet out, if we're going to translate that IP address, his source address, Bob's source address, like on this computer here, 10.16.0.10, if on the initial flow of traffic we're going to swap out that IP address for one that can be routed on the internet, that's referred to as source NAT because we're swapping out these source address on the initial flow of traffic. That's what it means. So let's imagine Bob's computer here is 10.16.0.10. Um, before it goes to the internet, we're going to go ahead and swap it. So if we looked at the packet, uh, the Bob, Bob's packet would have a source address of 10.16.0.10 before NAT. And let's imagine that he's going to a server. Now, in my little pretend internet here, I'm going to use some R an RFC 1918 address space of 192.168.1. Uh, but that's just for my little lab. So in this topology, anytime you see 192.168, that's just representing my little pseudo internet right here. So if Bob is going to his a web server, and this, his source address is 10.16.0.10, and his destination address is, uh, let's go ahead and make it uh, 192.168.1.100. Let's imagine that that is a server out here on this little pseudo internet. Now, the internet is not going to allow Bob to use a source address of 10 anything because it's a private address. And so what happens is we train this router, router 1, to do network address translation. And we simply give him rules. Uh, and those rules are going to say things like, um, please translate Bob's source IP address before you ship it out to the internet. And there's, there's like not 11 billion ways to configure it, but there's several. And so in this demonstration, I'd like to go ahead and talk about a couple of those, demonstrate them, and then make, confirm you know, what we did with the network address translation. So um, one of the options is we can create a pool of addresses that we can use with NAT. And so it would go something like this. Let's imagine our service provider uh, gave us a pool of addresses of 192.168.1.201 through 254. So they gave us about 50, <laughs> what is that? One th that's, that's, it's 54 addresses. So they gave us 54 addresses that we could use for the benefit of NAT. So what we could do is we could make a pool on our Cisco router and specify our pool range is 192.168.1.201 through 254. So that's our pool. And then we'd specify who we want to do the translations for if their traffic, and I'll use a different color here, if their traffic is going in this direction, outbound. Well, I mean, out to the internet. So uh, let's, let's make a plan together. Um, do we want this router to do network translation for everybody on the 10.16.0 network and the 10.16.8 network and the 10.16.16 network? Or... Do we want to just do network address translation for one of those networks? Or check this out. And if you've been with me in subnet Saturdays, you're going to love this. We could just say to the router, hey, if any of the source addresses begin with 10, let's go ahead and translate any of those source IP addresses that start with 10 as they go through the router. And to do that, we're going to use an access control list and a wildcard mask. They're not just for breakfast anymore. So even though we use wildcard masks with OSPF statements, network statements, we also use wildcard masks in uh, ACLs, and we're using ACL as part of this NAT statement. So um, let's take a look at all the pieces we would need to do, and then we'll, we'll just do it live on this lab. So we need to identify the interfaces involved on router one. I'll put them in, in blue. So the interfaces here that go up to the corporate network, this is gig 0 slash 0, and this will be important in just a moment, so we need to know which interfaces we're expecting those tra that traffic to come in on, and this would be, um, oh, I hope that's right, <laughs> this is this is gig 2 slash 0, and what I have is the gig 2 slash 0 actually covers 
both of these networks here. So PC2 and PC3, when they come in, they're going to be coming in on the 2.0 interface. So there could be lots of other routers between there, but they'll be coming in. And the reason that's important, we need to tell these interfaces on R1 that from a NAT perspective, those are internal or inside facing interfaces. And we do that with a little command called IP NAT inside. And I'll just label them here. So in the rules that we're going to give this router, we're going to say, hey, dear Mr. Router, any traffic that comes in on one of these inside interfaces, and if that traffic has the source IP addresses of 10 anything, and you're going to be routing those out to the internet, then we want you to go ahead and swap out that source IP address with an IP address from the pool before you forward the packet. Now, the client has no idea that this NAT is happening. But what happens is the router that, that's doing the NAT, it also could be a firewall in many cases. Uh, the NAT's often done on firewalls as well. But the device that's doing the network address translation remembers the details about the source IP address, the destination IP address, and it's also tracking all the ports involved. What layer four protocol was being used? Is it TCP, is it UDP, or is it something else? Because there's a few more other than just those two. And then it memorizes all the, all the ports, the source port, the destination port, because when that server on the internet responds back and goes back to that IP address that the NAT device you know, used, the NAT device has to do an untranslation. That's the only really good way to think about it. Untranslates the response and then puts the original IP address back in and then sends it back to Bob the user. So the initial flow of traffic, we're going to swap out the source address and on the reply when it comes back, that same NAT device is going to <laughs> undo his tangled web and so respond back to the client with his normal address. So again, the client doesn't really know that it, there's this magic happening. It just knows it has connectivity. So I think what I would like to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write some of this down because uh, we're going to have to configure it and this won't be on the screen while we configure it. So the pool is going to be 201 through 254. Awesome. And we are going to translate anybody who has a source IP address on 10. So that's great. I'm making a note of that. Uh, these two interfaces, gig 00 and 20, are going to be inside interfaces from the perspective of NAT. And that reminds me of something critical. That's this. This interface right here, which is gig 1 slash 0, we're going to label that as outside. And that way, as the router is making a routing decision, and the way it goes is like this. The router is a router first and foremost. And so it's making these, when it gets a packet, it makes a routing decision. So when a packet comes in on a certain interface, it looks at its routing table and says, OK, how do I need to forward this to move this packet on its way? After that routing decision is made, then that, after the routing decision is made, but before the packet's moved, if there's NAT rules in place, that's when it says, oh, this packet's coming in on an inside interface. It's going to an outside interface. It's going, to be, it's going to be routed out an outside interface. I need to apply the rules. Well, does it start with 10? Yep. <laughs> uh, do I have a pool of addresses I'm supposed to use? Yep. And then it goes ahead and swaps them out and then forwards the packet with the lied about source IP address. And that's how dynamic source NAT works on a Cisco router. So I think I have all the details here. I'm going to very carefully hide this screen, but not delete it, because we may need to come back to it. And uh, let's, go to, uh, let's go to a couple devices first, just to make sure what we're working with. The password you entered is not correct. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> all right, so uh, this is one of our clients. I'm just going to do some, a couple of verifications of IP addresses. And one way of doing that is just going to a command prompt and typing in ipconfig on this Windows 10 computer. OK, so this is 10.16.0.10 at corporate headquarters. I've got some other machines that we can play with. I've got one in uh, Nevada PC1. That'll do. He's got an IP address of 10.16.8.101. I'm going to jot those down, 10.16.8.101. And that is Nevada PC1. In our, in our drawing, which I will bring back for a moment, uh, I called him PC2. But 
PC1 is going to play our role of that device on the 10.16.8 network. And great, so I hide that again. And uh, let's also choose Florida PC1. So Florida is our other site, Florida PC1, its IP address. Oh, wow. Okay, 10.16.20. Good to know. All right, so I have their IP addresses. And if we set up our rules so that we're going to match on the first octet, the 10, it won't matter what the second, third, or fourth octet are. All right. Um, also, from router one's perspective, we'll, we'll be doing this. I want to make sure I have routes. If we don't have routes on a router, it's really hard for it to do its job. So this is the full routing table on this router. And the way we would read this, the command is show IP route. And the way we'd read this is um, there's, well, <laughs> we've already had videos on that. So this is the routing table. I just want to make sure we had reachability to basically everywhere. And, and on this router, we do. Some OSPF routes, some static routes, some directly connected routes. It's all wonderful. All right, so let's first of all create the pool of addresses that we're going to use for the translation. And to do that, the syntax is IP NAT pool. And then we simply create a pool name. How about uh, our dash pool? Just like that. So we've created this pool, and we ought to identify the details about it. So the range, I'm going to bring that back just for a moment. Um, the range we're going to use is 201 through 254 for the pool of addresses that we can use for the translations. So what we'll do is we'll simply specify that. We'll specify 192.168.1.201 space, and then the ending range which is 192.168.1.254 based on our plan. And uh, again, another peak here, just looking at our plan. Okay, that's our pool range of addresses. And we're also going to specify the net mask. This is one of the few times, by the way, where if you use the keyword prefix length, you can do a slash 24. Or if you want to use dotted decimal mask, you just put in the keyword net mask and then the three octet mask on that we're going to use and the last octet off. For that mask. All right, good to go. All right, one <laughs> one step down. No, we I guess two. We have our plan. We created this pool. Next, let's create an access list. Now, now when I was first learning Cisco back in the 90s, early well maybe it was late 80s. Anyway, when I was first learning Cisco, I I didn't really appreciate the value of an access list. I because I was taught, oh, an access list, you create it, you can put it on an interface of a router, and then it can control traffic, whether it will be permitted or not. That's all true. <laughs> but the access list, as it makes that identifying fact, uh, the, uh, the identification of traffic, like, yes, this matches, or no, that doesn't match, that aspect of matching on traffic is really the most important part of an access list. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an access control list that we're going to use as part of NAT. And in this access control list, we'll simply tell it, hey, we want to match on everything that begins with 10 and not care about the second, third, and fourth octets. And that's and then we'll use that as part of our NAT rules. So if we go to the desktop again here and we create an access list, let's do a do show access list. This is a huge, hugely important thing to do. Uh, bef <laughs> Here's why. Before... Before we create an access control list, we ought to verify if that access list already exists because the mistake that a lot of people make is they'll, they'll not know or not check to see if an access list exists. They'll create one, and what they're doing is they're adding lines to the bottom of this access control list, which is a nightmare. So whatever you're using the access control list for, uh, it's going to be messed up if you start adding lines uh, accidentally. So I did the show command right here. I did the show of access list just to see that we have no access list currently on this router. Then to create an access list, which we haven't done in our subnet Saturday, or our, we have not done this yet in our live streams for CCNA Sunday, and we'll, we'll do a whole section on access list, but the syntax, the syntax, one of the ways of doing it is access list, and then we use the number of one, which is a standard access list. And the difference between, or what a standard access list can do, let's talk about that. A standard access list can only match based on source IP address information. That's it. So if you and I were going out to lunch with the standard access list, we said, hey, how you doing? Can you match on a layer four protocol like TCP or UDP? It would say, I don't know what that is. <laughs> or 
<laughs> or if we said, hey, can you match on a destination IP address? It would say, nope. All I do is match on source IP information. That's it. That's all I do is a standard access list. And for our purposes, that's all we need. We're doing source NAT. We just want to match the source IP address information. So that's all we need. So we'll do a sort access list one, and then we'll specify permit, which means we want to match on this and allow it. Uh, we want to permit uh, anything that starts with 10. So here's some more context sensitive help. So we'll put in 10, anything, and then look at this. This is so fun. Wildcard bits are next. And here's how wildcard bits work. Wildcard bits simply say, I don't care. That's what they say. And so we're going to say 0 for the first octet because we want to match on that 10. So this 0 here corresponds to the first octet in the IP address that we're trying to match. We want to match on 10, but we don't care about the second octet or the third octet or the fourth octet. Hence, we're going to put 24 wildcard bits on. I only have 10, 10 digits here. <laughs> we're going to put 24 on for the rest of that, which means to the whatever whoever uses this access control, it says, okay, I'm, need, I'm matching on the source IP address of 10 dot anything. That's what this means. And we'll press enter. That's all we need for our access control list is um, matching on 10. All right. So we've made a plan. We've created the pool. And we can, uh, in fact, our pool is right here on the top of the screen with the range. We've made our access control list. We have not yet identified the interfaces by telling them their IP net inside or IP net outside. We'll need to do that as well. But the other thing we need to do is make a rule. And it basically goes like this. It's, it's a cute, it's a, not cute, that's the wrong word for it. It's a fun little statement that says, um, dear Mr. Router, if you see a packet, and if that source IP address matches 10, I want you to go ahead and translate that source address with one of the available addresses you have in that pool before you forward or route that packet out. And that's only if the traffic came in from a user on your inside interfaces and you're routing that traffic out on an interface that's been identified as an outside interface from a NAT perspective. So the syntax goes something like this. Uh, IP, <laughs> NAT, and we use some context sensitive help here. Um, Inside. So inside simply represents for heavy traffic that's sourcing or coming in from the inside, meaning it's going into the router on interfaces labeled as inside. And we are going to do source address translation, meaning we're swapping out the source addresses. And we are going to go ahead and do IP net inside source. We're using an access list that we just made. And then we're going to point to that access list that we just made. And then we're going to use a pool that we also just made well, a few moments ago. And then the pool name, this is important. If you get the pool name wrong, it won't work. So what did we call the pool name? We called it our pool. I'm going to copy paste that literally. Scroll down and right click and paste it in. Space. And then we have this keyword here, which I'm not going to use yet. But let's talk about, I'll bring up my video in a circle here. Let's talk about not enough IP addresses. If we had 100 clients in our company and in our organization, and they all wanted to go to the internet, there's not enough global, globally routable separate IP addresses for each one of them to have their own. So what we do is we use a game where we're going to use one IP address on the outside, and we'll simply have all those 100 clients as they go through. We'll tell the router, just you reuse that IP address over and over and over again. So Bob and Sally and PC1 and PC2 and everything else is going out to the internet. As they go out, their source address is being translated to that same IP address that has, we told Nat to use. And the challenge here is, well, well, if you have 100 clients and they're all going out to the internet with one IP address, when the internet comes back, when they respond, and all those packets are coming in, how in the world does the router know which, you know, which clients to untranslate those packets for and send them back? And the answer is ports. That's most of the answer. But the official answer is ports. It's, it's tracking on all the port information, and, that's, and, and it's keeping them unique. And so when a packet comes back to port 38,020, the PATH device, the router running network address translation, is going to say, well, oh, uh, I see that that port that I am associating with this session belongs to this client. It will untranslate everything and forward it back to the client. That is actually called PAT, Port Address Translation. And so 
when people talk about that and that, most of the time what's going on behind the scenes is probably some level of PAT because we're overloading on one IP address. And that's why it's called overload right here in the syntax. If we use the keyword overload, the router would say, okay, great, I'm just going to start loading up on one IP address. And we could also point to the interface. There's also an option of saying, map all these translations to the IP address, Mr. Router, that you have on your outside interface. That's an option as well. Um, but in our case, I want to demonstrate NAT. This is dynamic source NAT, meaning every client on the inside as they go out are going to get their own IP address from the pool. And, uh, and it's done dynamically. So what this would be called is dynamic, meaning the translations don't show up until the clients actually show up and say, I have traffic going out. So this would be called dynamic source NAT because we're giving a one-to-one -one mapping from the pool and we're also doing source address translation and it's happening dynamically based on client traffic going through. Dynamic source NAT, all right. So uh, let's press enter. And then um, let's do a do show IP NAT statistics. Okay, so here, this, here's what we have so far. <laughs> this is showing us we have a pool called our pool. This is showing us we're using access list one. Here's the pool range. Oh, yeah, we haven't told the router about its interfaces yet. So let's go ahead and bring up the visual here for a moment. We need to go to these interfaces, gig00 and 20, and say that they are inside interfaces from a NAT perspective of NAT. And on this interface, 1 slash 0, that it is the outside interface. So we'll do that now. And uh, you know, I'm not even going to guess at this. I'm going to do a uh, do show IP interface brief. I want to verify the interfaces. All right, so this interface here, gig00, is the one that goes up to the client PC. Gig20 is the interface based on its IP address and this topology that I'm fairly familiar with. This goes out to PC1 in Nevada and PC1 in Florida, the other two sites. And then this, gig1 slash zero, is my little pseudo internet that I have. So we'll go ahead on this interface, we'll specify that it's an IP net inside, we'll specify 2.0 is IP net inside, and we'll specify 1.0 is IP net outside. So let's, let's do it. So uh, we'll go to interface. I just want to make sure you get the interfaces right. Zero, zero, gig, zero, zero. Measure twice, cut, cut once. All right, and IP net inside, just like that. And we'll go to interface gig two slash zero and IP net. And what we just did right there was we just told these two interfaces as I checked my work, zero, zero and two, zero, perfect, that they are both inside interfaces from the perspective of NAT and we'll go to interface gig one slash zero. Uh, I need to click here, there we go. <laughs> interface gig one slash zero, which is gonna be our outside interface and the IP NAT outside. I, not IP NAT outside. I'll have it out there. Okay, uh, either way it would work because it's unique. Um, I think that's it. If you do a show IP NAT statistics, that's a really great high level overview of showing us our outside interfaces, our inside interfaces, the pool, the range, and the access list involved, and then we could do a show access list just to verify what that was. Okay, so anything that starts with 10 is going to be a match, and this NAT rule should kick off. And that's the live stream. <laughs> now, this is the point in the show. I dropped my paper. Now, this is the point in the, in the live stream where we, you know, the pucker factor. Oh, is it going to work? I hope it's going to work. I, I think we have routing in place. We've configured, we made a plan. We did the access list, we did the IP net inside, outside, we did the IP net inside source static command to tell it to do it. So let's test it. And to test it, we can do this. We can go ahead and do a show IP net translations. Nothing. And that's because it's on demand. Uh, or it's dynamic. It won't, there won't be a translation, so we have clients who are generating traffic. So let's go to our client PC and let's do a trace, let's do a trace. RT. So trace RT is how you spell trace on a Windows 10 computer. Dash D for don't bother doing name resolution and 192.168.1.100. That's the server's address. 
So it's being routed through the net. Oh, look at that. Yeah. OK, so it got to the server at dot .100. If we go back to uh, router 1, and now we hit the up arrow key, look at that. Nice. Nice. So when Windows does trace route, it uses ICMP. So to the end device, it kind of looks like a ping request. Um, but there we go. So there's our translation. So this host at 10.16.0.10 on the inside was assigned the IP address for the translation of 192.168.1.201. And because we're using NAT, not PAT, the next client, the next different client that we send traffic through should use a different address. Um, let's go ahead and... Um, well, let's actually, let's, let's up the, yeah, let me, let me demonstrate on client that we can open up a browser. Let's open up a browser. Go to the same server, uh, 192.168.1.100. There's a beautiful web page from that server. We'll go back to our management computer, hit the up arrow, and boom. So look at this. I love this. Um, there's our translation. That hasn't changed, but now we have TCP traffic that's being tracked that it's being used for so the client used the source port of 1546 going to the well-known port of 80 and the other ones that the icmp it timed out so based on the actual sessions that are in use if they're not seen for a while they'll time out but the mapping is still here so perfect all right let's go to a different device let's go to and bring my topology here Let's go to uh, the device on the 10168 network. That's going to be represented by Nevada PC1. So we'll go to Nevada PC1 here, and its IP address is 10168101. Let's first do a let's do a ping to 192.168.1.100 to verify if it works or not. <laughs> I'm pleasantly surprised. And let's go back to R1. Oh, I moved him out of position. What is that? Okay, hold on a second. I want to go back to R1. I want him up here. Oh, please. Uh, okay, I'll split screen it. Let's do that. Okay, so here's R1 all by himself, and here's the rest of the world. So on our on R1, if we do a show IP NAT translations. Oh, I need it bigger. Hold on a second. I want you right there. All right. Let me do the up arrow key again so it's not all crunched in. So here's our translation for our PC, the, the Windows client. And this is the translation that was just invoked for the device 10.16.8.101, which is our Nevada PC. And there are the translations that it's using for that ping request. So back on this, one of the things I like about this virtual PC that we have is if we do a, a trace, um, we can do that trace with some options. We can, by default, it uses UDP, but we can also specify TCP for the trace, and so that way we can see those that path, path that path, <laughs> that traffic. I'm trying that traffic at and the network address translation. So let's do a trace to 192.168.1.100 and let's go for um, TCP. So we'll do a dash P for, I want to use the protocol, protocol number six. That is the decimal protocol number for TCP at layer four. So we'll issue that command. We'll go back and take a look at R1 and we should see that with that same translation of 202 for the client at 101, that it was doing some, had a session in place for, with TCP traffic. Let's do one more, and let's go to Florida PC1. So this represents yet a different a client on a different segment of our network, and we'll just do a let's do that same trace to 192.168.1.100, and this time let's use uh, UDP. So dash P, and UDP is protocol. Oh man, uh, 11? Yeah, no, uh, 17. Okay, so let me tell you why I did that. Um, <laughs> sometimes when you look at protocol analyzers, they'll show 17 as hexadecimal 11, which is a 16 position and a one. So that makes 17. So I didn't know if it was <laughs> asking for it. So decimal 17 is the protocol for UDP. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, so that worked. I'm gonna go ahead and do it again. Then we'll look at our translation table here on R1. 
and we should have a new translation for that new client, and we do. So there's the PC, the, the Florida PC we just worked with, and there's some of its UDP information. But once these sessions all time out, the actual UDP information, we're going to have separate translations, one for the Windows client. This is for our client in Nevada. This is for our client in uh, Florida. And that's how dynamic translation works with SourceNet on a Cisco router. So I, I think we got all the pieces. Let me bring up the topology again. Actually, let me, uh, let me clean off the back here. All right. So we are able to create the pool, identify the interfaces, if they're inside or outside, create the access list, create the NAT statement that said, if the traffic matches source address of 10, and it's being routed from inside to outside, go ahead and translate them, <clears throat> make a translation for them. Uh, from their original source address to an IP address in the pool. And that's it. So I think we, <laughs> I think that's everything I wanted to cover in this session. So um, I do want to thank you all for joining me for network address translation. This is at the CCNA level. Um, for CCNA, they're not going to ask a lot more than what we've just seen here. The other option would be just using PAT and, you know, um, using a single IP address. But this is as hard as it's going to get as far as configuration and understanding how it works at the CCNA level. Now, when we get to the professional level and IE level, there's all kinds of interesting stuff like destination NAT and um, uh, port redirection and all bunch of other options that can happen on different appliances. But for us, this is what we need to focus on. So thank you very, very much for uh, joining me today for this live stream of NAT. And with that, I'm going to sign off.